because growth hacking disrupts the structure using growth hacking techniques that give you the agility with the balance of structure. Growth hacking applies not just to startups, yeah. but to companies, nonprofits, government, but also uh, organized crime. And okay. the reason I mentioned organized crime is uh, they're one of the most fascinating areas in, in the area of growth to understand how they work. When we start with a, a fresh page and we say, I don't know, the only thing left is experimentation. The ingenious part of this whole process, as simple as it might sound, your real growth is gonna come from the unknown areas, places you never estimated, you never thought were possible. Um, I don't believe in a silver bullet and I don't believe in a single formula. Um, what works for me will not work for you and what will work for you will not work for me. But if I have a blueprint, which is a process that helps me find what works for me, then ideally that's my success. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Change Officer podcast where we have a lot of people that uh, they, they did a lot of changes in their life. Today we don't have a, the Change Officer, we have the, the Change General. His name is Nader Sabri. Nader, welcome to the Change Officer uh, podcast. Uh, we'll be discussing so many things. Uh, 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 it's, it's very interesting, you know, like when, when in one podcast you can talk about uh, entrepreneurship, when you can talk about uh, uh, growth hacking, when you can talk about uh, YouTube shows, uh, FBI, NASA, and so many interesting <laughs> things. Welcome to the Change Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I was most confused ever when doing this announcement, this, this opening of the show, because I want to talk uh, uh, with you about so many things. So, guys, I hope you have a lot of SD cards in your cameras so we can record two hours or so. The change officers are the people coming to uh, the change podcast. Why? Because you are the officers of change, you know, because you, you, you uh, embody uh, something that is uh, the only constant in life. Yep. But let's start uh, with your uh, personal life. You were sure. born... Where? And I was born in Canada. Canada? Yeah. You're Canadian? Right, yes. With the origins from? With my parents uh, immigrated to Canada in the 60s, so they've been there for, for I guess, half a century now when you calculated the, uh, yeah, I've been here for quite some time. Okay. Yeah. Then at the age of 14, you start. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> or maybe a little bit earlier, I don't know. Like, yeah, yeah, so I had like a great interest in entrepreneurship very early on. Um, I wasn't sure what it was until I learned a little bit more uh, as I moved through life, of course. but. I started with some very simple small businesses and uh, there's like a, an adrenaline rush when you make your first dollar and uh, you, once you get that adrenaline rush you don't stop. Right? What, what was it from you know, this first dollar? I, I think like I was probably selling like some cards or candy or something like it was just something so basic and minimal uh, it was just like you know I was like wow I mean what more can happen what more can I do I was even <laughs> selling firecrackers at one stage no. to a Chinese friend of mine who was getting them from Chinatown uh -huh. and where I lived people can get it I was like hey dude can you pick some up for me and I'll just sell it to friends at school and like because they couldn't get firecrackers where we were and it was just supply and demand how old were you I may have been like 12 13 this is when I first started to experiment with entrepreneurship without knowing it do, 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 yeah. do you think that entrepreneurs are born or they become well there's two types of entrepreneurs there's a voluntary and a non-voluntary or a, yeah non-voluntary entrepreneur mm -hmm. so a voluntary entrepreneur is someone like myself who is just got it in their system and it's something that they choose to do um, and then there's involuntary entrepreneurs those are people who come from the corporate world who say for example have been un, uh, made redundant or become recently unemployed and it happens to be that the only channel that they can use to to survive or move forward in life would be entrepreneurship or they've always wanted to try entrepreneurship and they've always been a corporate job so they're an, what I call an involuntary uh, entrepreneur because it's just not in their system and that doesn't mean that's an impossible for them it just means it's just a two different type of audiences so many people they categorize entrepreneurs as just one category but I always see it in two types of entrepreneurs okay now. so yeah. uh, for sure at 12 years uh, uh, of age uh, yeah you were definitely the born one yeah I, I knew that there was something in, in the system that was just like cooking up and I, I didn't know how to use it I got uh, my, my first mentor was one of my father's friends uh, and I was about I was about 13 14 as well like light mentorship because he had recognized the entrepreneur skill I had and he as an entrepreneur saw it and knew it and he would speak to my parents about nurturing the entrepreneurial skill which my parents didn't know what to do about because my dad's a scientist and my mom's a fashion designer so entrepreneurship is not really their thing yeah. <laughs> so it's a kind of like a weird mix so for those who know me it's like you know dad's scientist mom's a fashion designer and then I'm a fashion designer and I'm an entrepreneur it's kind of makes the definition of who I am and <laughs> that triangle right so yeah, yeah. okay so so then uh, um, at the age of 14 you went into a 
big business. What was that? <laughs> well, what happened was, okay, so this is in the 90s, just to put it into context. So I used to sit at night and I used to watch these infomercials. And, and I don't know if, the, if you guys can relate to this, but there was a guy named Don LaPree. And Don LaPree, unfortunately, took his life many years after this. But uh, he was the kingpin of, of the format that you would see in Instagram even today. Mm -hmm. And most people don't know that. So he, he created the, uh, or pioneered at least the infomercial format which is problem solution, how to fix it, benefits, bonus, take action, right? Mm -hmm. And he did this so well. I would sit and watch him completely mesmerized as a kid late night, like, wow, how does this guy do this? And so this guy was just um, very articulate, had everything in place. He was showing checks of people who were making $50,000 a month, just sitting at home. And um, although, I mean, I, I don't know how real that was. <laughs> yeah, but, but, from this perspective. Yeah, from that perspective. But the guy was just amazing. So what happened in the 90s, and I, I, they probably happen till today, but not as frequently. So they call them the franchise show. Franchise show is, is basically people who have franchises from anything to writing a resume at home all the way up to a, a food franchise, right? So it can be just really small business to large ones. They, they, it rolls into town, I remember, once or twice a year. So I decided to go to one of them. Uh, I met these guys out of the U.S. They ran a 900 number service. And so the immediately, obviously, we know what comes to mind when we think 900 number services, uh, but there was so much more to it. So these are information lines, right? It could be anything from, you know, telling the future, obviously, to adult services, to yeah. uh, I ran a genealogy service where people can call in who are about to have a baby. And so they give us some information with a format that I got from, from my mentor, actually. And you can find out if you can have a boy or a girl. So it was more of an entertainment thing rather than anything, uh -huh. but it became very popular. Um, so, so I took that franchise on, I was 14 years old. I wasn't even legal to call into my own service, uh, which, uh, yeah. I'm sure they knew, but they, they didn't care as long as I paid and I was actually going to do something about it. Um, and then as I tried different 900 number services, they were working, but nothing would outperform, of course, adult services. And yeah. so I took the, looking back, of course, at it today, the unfortunate <laughs> decision to go into the adult services business because uh, that's where the money was. And uh, it exploded. It ex exploded because I was able to add these PIN numbers to the phone number. So, and there was a way of tracking uh, campaigns. So it's like the old school way of tracking campaigns, you know, 800 or 900 so and so, and then PIN following. So I can add a special discount or an incentive to it. So I would do that. I would give it to, this, to a group of friends. I was like, hey, you can call in with this PIN. You won't get checked. Um, and, and I give you 50% discount on the pricing so you can spend more time on there, right? And so I became really popular, right? <laughs> you can imagine what that's like. So anyway, so I got like a ton of people on there. I made a lot of money. Um, and then the guys that run it, the, so they're called the Servers Bureau. The Servers Bureau that runs this recognized I was making a lot of money. So I get a call from these guys. Hey, we would like you to engage in deeper advertising so you can increase your growth. And intuitively at that time, I knew not to do it. But for some reason, I wasn't listening to my intuition. How about you were young? I was, yeah. And experienced I mean, in life. And, uh, well, I yeah. mean, it's, it's a lesson that I've learned through life. And, and those who are tuning in when it comes to change is like, listen to your intuition. Like your intuition knows things. Um, these are er energy frequencies. And I study these things. They have an interest in it. I'm not an expert, in it, but I study ed energy frequencies and, and how they work and how the intuition is influenced. Yeah. So um, anyways, I should have listened to my intuition. I didn't. Um, so these guys took me for a ride. Um, they were, they were basically making $30,000 a month out of me, uh, just in advertising, just to put it into numbers. And remember, this is like, I'm 14 years old in the nineties, making 30,000 plus dollars a month. And these guys are just taking me for a ride. Anyways, they turned out to be a, a bunch of scam artists. I mean, they were, they were not just ripping me off millions of other people. So um, you were earning 30,000. Yeah. More than that. I mean, they, I was, I was doing maybe like 40, 50 K and they were taking 30 K out of that. Uh, uh -huh. So they were, they were trying to hold back as much money as possible. Uh -huh. rather yeah, not yeah, to pay yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, Hey, we're going to put you in this advertising program. And then they would show you a whole bunch of things that look like you are getting the ads, but you're actually not. So this, that's the scam, right? Oh that, that was the scam behind yeah. it. Yeah. So, so, so when they did that, um, I wasn't getting my checks. I was spending all this money. Uh, I knew that things weren't right. I, I went to my mentor, who was my dad's friend at that time, and he's like, well, we should report these guys. I mean, these are criminals, they're, they're crooks, they're, they're, they're thieves, they're, you know, and w what do we do? So, so we make some calls and, and, and I'm based in Canada, these guys are based in the US. And so long story short, we found out we need to talk to the FBI. Uh, <laughs> and uh, my dad's friend makes the call on my behalf because I'm not legal. Yeah. Um, and he, he explained them the story and they were fascinated. They're like, really? Uh, and, they're, and they're like, you know, you, you probably want to meet this guy. Uh, he's maybe somebody who could be very good for you who understands yeah. commercial crime because I, de I had basically deconstructed all these different things related to them and I was building this case against them because I, I want to get even, right? That was my, yeah. my incentive. Uh, so long story short, I became uh, an FBI informant to get these guys. 
Um, and that wasn't the last time I had done something like that. They'd recognize they can draw on me on a few different other mm -hmm. skills. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was one of my first experiences. I got a mega rush. Did you get paid from FBI? No, 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 no. I, I, I want to get my money back. And that's what I was after. I didn't get my money, but I got one hell of an experience. My yeah. dad was my first VC. I lost his money. He's like, you got to pay me back. I felt that was a bit harsh, but it was an excellent lesson in life. Yeah, of course. Um, then I went and invented my next business. I was sitting depressed in a coffee shop thinking, how am I going to get my dad's money back? I was yeah. completely shattered i was maybe yeah 15 or 16 years old at that time and um i was i was in a coffee shop and they put this paper mat do, do you remember that they i don't know they don't really yeah, have it in this part. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just a normal paper mat you put your coffee your food and then they take the paper mat and throw it out so i took this paper mat and asked the guys like how many of these do you go through in a month and he said something like go through like a, a thousand or two thousand of these i was like that's a lot how much do you spend on this he gave me the amount and then i was like you know what if i was able to do it for free for you would you would you do it he's like how would you do it for free I said, well, I'll get back to you in a week because I have an idea. So I took it and I took a pencil. How old you were there? 15. So 15. FBI is 14. Yeah, so and about a 15. year later. Yeah, 15, yeah. So I had to come up with the money. I had to pay my dad back. I owed him some money <laughs> that, that I lost. Um, so on this paper, I, I, I drew boxes of where advertisements would go on the, on the front and the back. And it was a micro advertising solution yeah. for um, local businesses, exactly community based businesses. Yeah. So I, I would be in this coffee shop and then in the plaza, there'd be like a flower shop and a video shop. I'm like, hey, you know, for just for one hundred dollars or two hundred dollars, I can get you here and a customer can just walk over to you. And so there was nothing like that in the market. So I did it for a few restaurants. It started to work. And then and the next thing I know, I, I, I probably cleared around $160,000, $180,000 doing this until an advertising company caught on to my model, copied it, drove me out of business. Uh, and that was the end of that, right? So I had made my money back, paid my dad, uh, bought my own car. Uh, and, and, and so my mentor was like, that's okay. That's business, right? You've got two, three failures under your belt. Keep going. It's not yeah. a failure when somebody yeah. tricks you, you know, like it's, yeah. it's a learning, yeah? It's, it's a, a learning, yeah. I mean, yeah. it was huge learning. I mean, I, I learned how to build resilience very quick. I learned how to become very innovative very quick. I realized that opportunities are all around you. Like opportunities, I always tell people, opportunities are not in front of your eyes, they're under your nose. So stop looking and start smelling. They're that close to you. They're that close to you. Yeah. So literally, I mean, the mat is underneath me. I can smell <laughs> the paper <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and I'm looking yeah. forward for, for an opportunity. And, and, and yeah, so, so, so at that point, like my mentor at that time, uh, I had another advertising solution that was quite revolutionary and disruptive at the time. And he discouraged me from doing it, which was unusual. I was like, come on, man, like I'm on a roll here. What's, what, why shouldn't I do it? He's like, he's like, I think you're too intelligent for this business. You need to use your ability somewhere else. And that was when he introduced me to the internet, when it wasn't even known really as the World Wide Web at that That's time. That's 1990s again. Yeah, 90s, 93, 94. And then, and then shortly after that, I'd found my two co-founders and founded one of the first internet service providers in the world, Canada Online, which competes with AOL uh, at that time. Oh. So yeah. America Online and Canada Online. Canada yeah, Online. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so we were competing with AOL in the Canadian market. And you uh, were 15 still? Uh, 16? I was uh, 16, uh, probably 16, 17 oh, at that time. Yeah. Mature then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Moving really quick. Uh, you know, I wasn't really excited to go to school. Uh, but, you know, I, I managed to get through it. I, I, in university, I was asked to come teach about internet at school yeah. rather than showing it. It was pretty cool. But it was funny because it was like I was teaching things like how do you use email? Could you just imagine that, right? Yeah. Like, how do you use email? How to set it up? What is the internet? How does it work? And my inspiration at that time, uh, I remember like it was... Um, uh, my mentor bought a few books for me and we started reading, I mean, just to learn about what, yeah. what's the future of the internet, what's this thing going to look like. And it, I think it was in an article, if I recall, not in a book, and it was a stat that I literally cut out, put on my wall. It says, by year 2000, more people will be using the internet than the most populated country in the world. And that was like the trigger that I knew that the rest of my life would be around tech and innovation. Because the, the revelation of what the internet is was going to do to people that nobody saw at that moment became like just an instant flash in my mind. A um, whole bunch of things were just became possible that weren't possible. The problem was adoption, which is still the problem today. Um, and different scenarios, uh, and since we're talking of change, you know, like different scenarios take place, like e-learning when it comes to the pandemic. I mean, e-learning had come in the early 2000s. I remember by 1999 or 2000, I mean, we had early e-learning systems that were working pretty robust. Yeah. But it was only until 20 years later that e-learning came to full fruition of because course. of adoption. So it can take 20 they, years easily. They usually yeah. say that the, 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 the most important uh, 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 thing for any company, uh, entrepreneurship uh, or startup is timing. Timing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. You should be yeah. in a forefront, but not too much because if yep. you're too early, that's yep. also the thing. Yeah. And, uh, and so on. Okay, so then yeah. th this ISP really grew big and yes. uh, you were 
So we, IPO the choir. We were going same to go. Time yeah, so we were going to go. I, we were in the process of going IPO. We our, finished our presidential list, and we were doing the distribution and all that. And then um, it was in the works in the background. So we had basically two options: get acquired or go public. We said, "Well, what's in our control is go public, not to get acquired." Uh, once they saw we were going public, they acquired us very quickly. Uh, so it worked. <laughs> it worked. Um, no, but, but, uh, the idea of going public. Who had that idea? See, you or your partners between, or your mentor? See, between the three of us, uh, two of us didn't want to go public and one of us wanted to go public and wanted to run the publicly traded company. And the reason, I was one of the guys that didn't want to go public, actually. And the reason being was that I didn't want to get into the bureaucracy of having to report quarterly. And I, I, I just wanted to build companies. I just wanted to do what I was good at, what I was passionate about. It's just building and growing companies. And I didn't want to get into all the, the, the complication that comes with it. Uh, but at that point, Internet companies were hot. Um, our, our law firm that was representing us was, was like, listen, we, we want you to go public because there's so much demand on this. Like the, as, as you said, timing, like that was the right time. And so we literally had got bought out two months before the dot bomb had happened. Like literally, I mean, it, it was about three months. Was it luck? Time. Luck. No, yeah, luck. No, no. We could have not predicted have seen that at all. 100% luck. But what yeah. is your thinking now? If you are having your business, which is growing, 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 do you go up IPO or not, or ICO, I, or whatever I, I, you decide? I, I like I have some founder friends who have been in the same situation, and usually what they do is like before they go public, buy me out and just just go public, or give me a piece of it, and I'll step out of uh, operations. Uh -huh. And usually what because happens... Because it's not the same business. Basically. It's not the same business. So what happens yeah, yeah, is yeah. like a, a really smart board would be like, okay, we, we don't want to get rid of this guy. Let's pay him out, but let's keep him in so that he's invested in helping support the business, but not necessarily running the business. So the kinds of people, I mean, I, I have clients who are publicly traded companies that I work with as well, uh, who I support in their growth. But I wouldn't want to be the guy who's like in, always under pressure for a quarterly report and you know why did this happen or happen? Because in business, I mean, so many things are just unpredictable. And when it comes again to the theme of change, I need to be agile as possible. What, what I would of be course. doing today, I may have to change completely tomorrow. And, and so that's why companies kind of stay static, right? They're, they're so worried about their shareholders, so worried about the, the public image that they just choose not to change or make very little change or make it look like they are changing, but they're not. And hence you get a Nokia. <laughs> what, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 What happened, yeah. you know, like, but, yeah. but uh, the, uh, uh, we had a guest here in uh, the change officer who said there are startups, you know, there are ideas, then there are startups, yep. then there are scale ups, yep. and then there are uh, public companies. Yep. Like uh, uh, for startups, you can be, as you said, agile, yep. you can do this, you can be creative, you can yep. give your full potential. In the scale ups already, if you have 10 million or 20 million uh, uh, investment, you have to become a more serious startup which they call a scale up yeah and then uh, 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 after that if you go IPO then you are uh, you know like a yeah highly more much more regimented yeah I mean I'm, I have nothing against structure and regimentation I mean it's, yeah. it's not a bad thing as long as it's the right thing in place and that's where the problem comes in and that's why I love growth hacking because that's what growth hacking does right we accelerate the growth process using structures that enable to do that and oh, so you have to repeat that uh, yeah you're you're you, what you just said. You can so, so, so that's why I love growth hacking, yeah. right? Because growth hacking disrupts the, the, the structure. Using? Uh, using growth hacking techniques that give you the agility with the balance of structure. So le, le yes. me, yeah, let, yeah. Me, let me give you like a, a few examples. Okay, can can yeah. we go back to that? Yeah. yeah uh, remember that example. Yeah. Because I don't want to skip NASA. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that's sure. your life story, yeah. man. That, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't, we'll have a lot of time to talk. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, 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 luckily, you're a quick thinker and quick talker. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so my question is, uh, then uh, you were acquired by a company yes. which uh, later become uh, So later, they, I mean, yeah? the, the way the industry was working at that time is like the smaller fish gets eaten by, eaten by the bigger fish and it was just kept growing until yeah. finally it's the telcos that end up buying up all the ISPs. So at the end, it was AT&T Canada that ended up acquiring us. So it was a firm before it that bought us and then AT&T bought, bought that firm with us in it and, and that was the last acquisition and it just stayed like that so we knew we knew uh, as well like and by 1996-97 we knew that the telcos were the ones who were going to control this space but until then we knew that the independent isps will will pave the way for the telcos and the telcos will end up just buying it that, that, that is a good good observation also uh when you're a small business i think and and please correct me uh, if i'm wrong, but it's always good to be a part of someone's much bigger story to yeah. be at the right place at the right time yeah, absolutely to get 
exited or acquired or whatever you call yeah. it uh, uh, by someone who has bigger plans. No, exactly. I mean, I mean, I say the secret sauce to exiting is you need to be a pain to somebody. And so what do I mean by pain is like they either cannot do what you can do or they don't want to do what you do or you do it so well that they can't repeat it that it's cheaper for them to buy you even if it's a lot of money for you. Yeah. That's an exit. Um, that's, that's how it works. So when we exited, I remember like the valuation per, per user that we had is not even seen till today, actually. The valuations have completely changed. I think it was $150 yeah. per customer for an ISP yeah. and that time we got acquired. Today is not, not even close to that, pennies yeah. on the dollar. Yeah. Yeah, not even close. Uh, yeah. Okay, so so uh, how did you how NASA jumped in the, your life story? Is it? Is oh, okay. So, so after uh, that, yeah. you exited the company. So I bu- like I built many companies after that, right? So I had like many successes and failures. I built an early stage. All uh, digital? Uh, not all digital, but most of them. Ha- like, so everything that I do has innovation or tech involved in it. Whether it's a tech company or it's a traditional business with tech that drives it, it's always part of the story that I that, that I work with. So. Um, yeah, so I, I built several tech companies. I built a first generation AI company in uh, year 2099. Like that was one of the Whoa. first things I built after. Uh, and it was designed for the venture capital industry. Uh, so we worked with um, people like garage.com, which is mm-hmm. uh, got founded by Guy Kawasaki. Uh, so we were trying to basically uh, find a faster, easier, more accurate way to evaluate business plans and, and pitch decks and then be able to identify the opportunities very quickly and then, and then those who are almost ah, opportunities. Not to waste time. Not to waste time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And find those who are almost opportunities to guide them how to become an opportunity because there's, oh. a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a bridge there that we saw from data that was like, there was, let's say like a, a firm is just, a, a startup, sorry, is missing like just a few things, but they would just not make it through the process. Um, then would it be wise to guide them because all they had to, you know, they always say like- To get this, up to the- Yeah, exactly. Stage. They say success is like an inch away, right? So it's just like that, or a millimeter away, just like that little yeah, movement yeah. and boom, you're there. Yeah, yeah. So that's what we saw and we were using data to do that. But we didn't do very well uh, because we couldn't raise the next amount of money. That was the dot bomb time. And so tech was toxic. Nobody wanted to touch tech. People didn't understand tech uh, because they didn't understand it well at the time. They were like, yeah, we don't want to touch it. It's a bunch of, you know, it's a balloon. It's a hoax. And it's not true, actually, that we know that now. Obviously, everybody knows that now. But at that time, it, it wasn't was. known. But it was. Uh, but only the companies who had some background stayed. You know, like, yes, of course. Uh, like, like, but, yeah. but, but, uh, but obviously, there were a lot of uh, scams and things. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. so tech, yeah, I mean, I agree with you. It's almost like cryptocurrency today. Like cryptocurrency <laughs> is like, uh, I mean, see, okay, so I'm going to be very open with my bias on this one. So, yeah. so I'm pro the tech. So I think the tech and the concepts behind it are solid. The people who are using it is where the problem is. So we got a lot of people from very shady backgrounds. And that's what, what we saw in 2017. Yeah. That's what we're seeing again today, right? Yeah. So people using it for all kinds of crazy things they shouldn't be. Um, yeah. Useful. Yeah. Okay. So, so after that, uh, a lot of uh, uh, so, success and failure. Yeah. One of the things that you did was uh, NASA Tech. Yeah, so prior to that, I, I actually went into government for a while. So I, I became a policymaker. Um, I, 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 lo- I was in the lobbying industry. Then I went into policymaking uh, for the region here. At the so, age of 17. What? Yeah, no, well, no, not no, at that no. age. No, no, no. Like at that point, I cut my teeth quite a bit, um, yeah. which was interesting because yeah. I had, um, I mean, if I was to kind of uh, step back and sum up all my experiences, I've learned how decisions are made and why they're made the way they are and how to manipulate <laughs> to get the decisions yeah. you want. Uh, so yeah. You, what you were working in the government, creating policies, uh, advising on creating yeah, policies. Yeah, so, so as, chief, as chief strategist for the economic department here in Dubai, and then I founded the investment office for uh, the, the FDI office, which is for foreign direct investment. So this is part of like just larger policies uh, to, to bring in companies um, to set up Dubai. Dubai is like, you know, I, I feel so close to Dubai. I feel like it's like my own product. Because yeah. uh, every time I, I go around, I was like, I remember when this, we were working on that. And, and it's amazing to see where it's going. And it's amazing to see where Dubai is going to be going after this, by the way. Uh, Dubai is one of the most agile cities in the world. Um, a, an extremely agile, motivated uh, government and an inspirational leadership that drives this place. It gives it an energy that is unlike any other place. So, um, you know, very happy and proud to be in Dubai and be part of the product, which we call Dubai, yeah. right? So after that, yeah, I went into consulting with one of the top strategy firms as head of innovation and thought leadership. Um, you know, they, they, they had some challenges with thought leadership and innovation, so I came in to help solve some of that. And then I kind of, I, I couldn't work for anyone after that anymore. I, I just stopped. I was like, 
Um, do you want I to do my own thing? Ten, ten years in government. It's not like you're yeah. just mentioning it like it's a yeah, yeah. ten years here. There's a know. whole bulk of interesting things happened in that yeah. decade. Yeah, spending with government and policy making and, and foreign direct investment. Uh, it, yeah, there's, there's a lot under that hood. <laughs> yeah. We are still about to come to the, to the main topic of this uh, podcast. We are still, still yeah. making an intro. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. <laughs> yes, which is a growth hacking, of course. Yeah. But, but uh, 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 what, what happened then? Like, like you, you yeah. said you don't want to work for... Yeah, so uh, I founded two companies after that. So one was a strategy firm. Uh, so I, got, I had two partners from McGill University. So we developed um, a, a strategy firm. Uh, I went from an operating partner to an equity partner. Uh, but in the background, I was developing my own, another company, which is my second company, which is Times Five. So this is a, a, an innovation company that was certified by NASA. It became the 43rd company in history to be certified through their certification program. Um, and while doing that, I became uh, I, I was honored by them in the uh, uh, space uh, space museum of history in Colorado Springs in the Discovery Center. Uh, so that's kind of my uh, footprint in the space. <laughs> uh, yeah. So space in, in space industry in the space yeah. industry yeah so you founded two companies one of them is this uh, nasa tech company yep. and so on and how did you come to growth hacking so so growth hacking um how is this this a tenth change in your life how does it happen yeah. the change yeah or you were hacking it all the time I don't well know. i've been growth hacking for a long time without knowing i was actually growth hacking so the term growth hacking has only been coined or termed in the last decade but it's been happening for a very long time. And as a practice, it's becoming a lot more sophisticated and more developed. Um, so you can't really go to Harvard today and say, hey, I'd like to get an MBA in growth hacking. That's not where it is today, but it's a very, um, it's a very dynamic practice. And it, basically what it is, is it's about, it's about accelerating growth. So it's getting disproportionate results. And it's, a, it's specialized techniques to do that. So as I was building my last company, I'd, I'd get all these guys I work with, especially out of the Silicon Valley, like, hey, you're such a growth hacker. Oh, this is a great growth hacker. I'm like, what is growth hacking? <laughs> what is this about? Right? And so one guy that I highly respect in the Valley is like, you need to start a growth agency. You need to be, start something to do with growth hacking. You're so, you're so good at this. You need to teach other people what to do. And that's, so that's when I wrote my first book, Ready, Set, Growth Hack, that became a best-selling book, which was a blueprint how to do that. I took 25 years of accelerating growth of, of organizations um, one of the most interesting, so I use the word organizations because growth hacking applies not just to startups, yeah. but to companies, nonprofits, government, but also uh, organized crime. And <laughs> the reason I mention organized crime is uh, they're one of the most fascinating areas in, in the area of growth to understand how they work. So, yeah. You, you, yeah. Ha you had to analyze that and, yeah. and, and, and so on. Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, you become an author yeah. and a uh, public speaker. Yeah and uh, mentor and this is what you do uh, uh, what is your uh, what is your gro growth hack how can do you want to scale now what's your what's your idea about well, uh, what i'm doing is I, i've realized that a lot of people who come to me uh so so a lot of people come here are, are startups uh, either in the early stage or scaling process and they're usually uh, very tight on resources. Uh, they can't really afford my services like the corporates would. And so I had to find a solution how to growth hack that. So that's when I started writing books, developing courses, uh, making videos, doing keynote talks. And the reason is that they're free to low cost entry points that lower the friction of learning. And so I've enabled the, I've enabled the startup environment to be able to tap into these tools without having to hire um, a, a very expensive expert or what would be an expensive expert in their world anyways. Uh, you pay for what you get. That's, that's yeah. the definition of what's affordable yeah, or not. Yeah. Um, because it's not scalable, you, know, yeah. you have only limited amount of time that exactly. you can use, yeah. you cannot uh, exactly. address to anyone, uh, but the book is a, a good uh, exactly. example. Okay, yeah. so growth exactly. hacking. Uh, can help uh, no, no matter it's not about startups it's not about scale ups it's not about uh, it's, uh, it's not about the size of the company it's about uh, how they can grow even more yeah 100%, 100%. it's accelerating the growth rate so so that's essentially what, so we I, I have a visual that I use so and, yeah. and I'll describe it so for okay. this because everyone's listening in here so imagine that you put in four units of effort and you get one unit of results that's okay. how most of us grow, yes. right? Yeah. And then in the middle, there's growth hacking, which is a process that does the exact opposite. One unit of effort with five units, or sorry, four units of It sounds, it sounds too, good to be, too good to be true. It does sound too good to be true. 
That's but, why but it's true. But it's true. Well, I mean, so unicorns are the best example in the world of, of growth hacking. So 98% of unicorns use growth hacking, whereas 1.5% of Fortune 1000 companies are starting to use growth hacking techniques. And roughly 12% of, um, I can't remember the number of, I think it's actually 11% of corporates will actually engage in some growth hacking activities. I'm not talking full, full throttle, but engage in it. What's more shocking is about 22%, which is almost doubled our corporates, as, as startups actually will engage in growth hacking as well. The only category where a, an organization is built 100% around growth hacking are unicorns. That's why they're worth a mm. billion dollars more. So what's the difference? It, it has everything to do, first off, with mindset, how you think and, and, and work with growth. But the next part is the structure that enables your mindset. So what that means is your normal corporate would have your, uh, sorry, leadership and then you'd have your functions. So marketing and operations and HR. And then underneath it, each one of them would be responsible for growth. That's your typical structure. A growth enabled organization like a unicorn is the opposite way. Uh, growth would sit right under leadership and everything would be subservient to growth. If it doesn't work, it's out. If it works, how do you do more of it? And if you continue to do it, how long will it last? So, so in, in some way, uh, as you said, uh, the growth uh, uh, management has to be on top of all the other services. Growth must be a yeah, priority. So, so, so I'm, I'm not talking about fancy PowerPoints that say growth is our priority or growth yeah. is our instinct and all this crap. I mean, that, that's BS. Uh, what it is is about the mindset and how the structure actually really works. So if you go to like an Uber, I, you know, I have a few friends that work at Uber, not as drivers, of course, but in corporate. <laughs> uh, and I ask them, like, so what's your structure like? And I ask the question, and I was like, oh, it's kind of, you know, um, you don't really get an answer because it keeps changing. It's, ex it's extremely agile. So you know who does the R&D, but they keep changing it so much because of the, the ability to, to be so agile. And I was like, that's a unicorn, right? That, that's how it works, right? You, you know who does what, but it's not designed like in a department. Everyone is in a team designed just to grow. The objective is just growth. That's it. That's it. Uh, yeah, so, so, but, but uh, who does that? There, there are not uh, growth hacking managers that are hired. You're starting companies? to see it now. You're starting to see, um, uh -huh. or, so this is the 1.5% of Fortune 1000s. So this is where you'll start to see a growth manager or head of growth hacking or um, a growth director. Mm -hmm. you, you, start, you start to see it happening. And I have a lot of these guys that reach out to me now where um, they get appointed to these roles and they're like, they don't know what to do or yeah. they need help to do it. Like digital transformation, yeah. Fury is back. You know, like, yes. I'm digital transformation lead. I'm not sure what else should I do, but... Uh, Absolutely, like, yeah. So this is uh, with the growth hackers. Exactly. So people from the company become growth, let's say, like, uh, like uh, hiring people uh, uh, to, to the different positions. Yep. But in startups, usually those should be the CEOs, like uh, oh, absolutely. founders. Yeah. It starts you know? from the very top all the way down. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So they're, 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 they would be the initial growth hacker and driving growth in the organization. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So how, yep. how do you know that some company is ready for uh, the, the growth hacking? Technique or well, I mean, uh, we, start with, we start with what's called the growth problem. So, so the growth problem is where we start to identify. We have like, um, we have like a, okay, so I have a few diagnostic tools that I've mm -hmm. created. Mm -hmm. The first one is we look at nine uh, just typical questions. If you answer yes to any of them, you got a growth problem. And so hence, therefore, you need growth hacking. I have a diagnostic tool with about 300 points that we use to actually diagnose a business. So we go through it and, and the objective behind it is not to tell me if you have a growth problem or not, to identify what kind of growth problem it is and how it's actually uh -huh. impacting your business. Yeah, this was, yeah. Uh, so maybe I don't know yes. that my business needs, uh, like uh, is, ready to, to do the growth well, this hacking. Is, this is most of the cases. So, uh, so I'll give you so a good example. So somebody approach you. So, so, so let's say I'm the company. I approach you and say, what, what do you say? Like, uh, how can I grow more? Or? I need to grow more. I want to grow more. I yeah. want to scale. I'm not getting enough customers. Yes. Uh, the cost of acquisition okay, is too yeah. high. I, 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 <laughs> what would you say? Uh, yeah. So sorry. Yeah. I, I want to grow more. I want to have more customers. And yeah. I, can, can, can you do that with my company? We can, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, we can, can we you can. can you show me? So, okay, so I, I approached you. What happens? That's, that's a customer journey. Yeah. Of of your. Of so your we user so group. so the first thing is like okay so we we work through three steps. One is the growth problem. Next is the growth experiments, and then after that is growth extension. So this is what I talk about in my blueprint in the book, which mm -hmm. I openly teach people about. It's not a secret. Yeah. Uh, they can do it themselves. Uh, the starting part is identifying what really the growth problem is and understanding the growth problem in depth. So. In, in your case, uh, from what I understand, the, the growth problem is you've got this new product, 
right? And so you want to get this new product to the right type of customer yeah. in a cost-effective way, and you need to innovate the way that you continuously drive the operational process in order to scale. So you can have a scaling problem. So although you may implement it with one or a few clients, is, is a question is like, how do I get a thousand more of these clients and scale this thing, right? Yes. And so, so most people like, you know, like for example, I'll give you a good example. Like I have some coaches that approach me, and so they're like, uh, you know, you know, I want to get way more customers. I want to be able to charge a lot more for what I do. And I say, okay, so I, I tell my, listen, I have a model that I use. I mean, you, you have to go get your first customer and then you go from one to 10 and then from 10 to 100, from 10 to 1,000, from 1,000 to 10,000, 10,000 to 100,000, and finally from 100,000 to a million. You're 10Xing in each one of these intervals. So, so from one to 10, most people are quite comfortable. 10 to 100, people get a bit itchy. The, 10 yeah. to 1,000, yeah. they're like, How, where am I gonna get 1,000 people? I said, yeah. there's your growth problem right there, right? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. And so we're not there yet, right? How do I manage one client versus 10 versus 100 versus 1,000 is very different, actually. How we respond to them is very different. Yeah. So my company now, uh, uh, one part of my company, my product, Castvio, has doesn't have uh, that many clients, like 10. We, we are up to 10. So you're 10. So now you yeah, need to go from 10 to 100. 10 to 100. Yep. yep. Okay. So do I start growth hacking there? Or, or I start... You have to, yeah. So, so the second part of the process is, is experimentation, okay? Okay. So you need to be experimenting as much as possible. So With what? Uh, with what you're doing now to find how to scale. Okay, so I'll, I'll give you some uh, examples on how we work with this. So one of the biggest problems that I face, and I've talked about this numerous times, which I call the boardroom ego. So the boardroom ego essentially is you get four or five guys from your company together. Literally, it could be the board or just your team, and everybody happens to know the answer. Like, everybody knows the answer. But the question is, why is there a problem if everyone knows the answer, right? You, we've all yeah. been there. So obviously, there's a disconnect in the mindset, and there's a disconnect how growth actually works. So to combat this, um, I have a process where we walk in, we start talking about, say, listen, there's a statement we're all going to adhere to, and it starts with, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's a statement we all start with to refresh everything. When we start with a, a fresh page and we say, I don't know, the only thing left is experimentation. Because the only thing, the only way for me to find growth is to experiment and see where it is. Now, the ingenious part of this whole process, as simple as it might sound, your real growth is going to come from the unknown areas, places you never estimated, you never thought were possible. This is what happens in every single case. And that's why we experiment. Now, when people hear experiments, they think, oh, this yeah. is going to be long, expensive. Yeah. Um, it's going to be complicated. And that's not the idea. It's, it's designed to be fast, simple, cheap and with one measure, we call it you know, the one North Star measure. And what we're looking for are signals. We're not looking for um, a result, right? Because once we find a signal, we can further experiment down that channel and it's justified because all we get is just like a beep. That's all I need, yeah. it's just a, a beep. Yeah. I don't need, if it's nothing, I know <laughs> it's nothing. You, you don't need a symphony of it. You don't, yeah, you exactly. A, you don't need a symphony. Yeah. That's what people are looking for, right? Yeah. I like that announcement. People are looking for the symphony, but yeah. you only need a beep. Yeah. And then from there, you know that there's potentially something there, and then you continuously experiment down that route until the signal gets strong enough that you've got something that you develop. In a just to make hack. things clear, yep. uh, when you say experiment, you say uh, experiment the growth techniques or growth channels that, you can, that your business can grow. That yep. can be a marketing channel, that can be a sales channel, that can be a, a, a onboarding and, and post-sales yes. post channel. So we sales. call this cross-functional growth hacking. So when growth hacking first started out, it was purely technology, just literally. It was just tech. It was just hacking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. that's where the term comes from. And then it evolved into what was coined as code plus marketing, which is essentially just the marketing function plus technology. Yeah. Today, we're shifting into what's cross-functional, just like what you mentioned. So it'd be, you'd be using tech, you'd be maybe using marketing plus operations, or marketing plus HR, or HR plus strategy, or R&D plus operations. And so that cross-functional capability is what, is what really allows growth hacking to shine in its best day, or, or what, you know, yeah. in, its, in its best way anyways, yeah. 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 So, 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 okay, so uh, we have, how many sessions we have, like, uh, I approached you and said, okay, I want to grow Castvio and uh, I want to become a global company and uh, I have 10 clients uh, just yeah. now and uh, how do I become... Well, it's uh, difficult to put a number how many experiments we get and, and you're, I'm glad, yes, uh, we run something called um, Growth Labs and it's, it's a data, uh, so it's a data framework where we use AI to answer those types of questions. Mm. I actually do have a number for you, which I'll share with you offline for a certain reason. Oh, really? um, but it's not a set in stone and that's why yeah. I, I, I don't like to go and say, so let me step back here because I have a bias and there's a good reason for, for those who are listening in. Um, I don't believe in a silver bullet and I don't believe in a single formula. Um, what works for me will not work for you. 
and what will work for you will not work for me. But if I have a blueprint, which is a process that helps me find what works for me, then ideally that's my success. So today's world, we're very conditioned by, you know, and I, I hate to say this, but the Tony Robbins of this world, but yeah. Tony Robbins is someone I respect actually. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> put him in a good light there because, yeah. because he deserves it. But, um, you know, he, he and the likes of have been very good at selling the silver bullet. Uh, you know, you have a life problem you want to change, come to me. Uh, you know, you, you're looking for, awaken the giant within you. Like, okay, what does that mean? Is it absolutely abstract? <laughs> but, yeah. but, but there you go. Uh, I know there's much more to it than that. But the point is that, um, I never encourage a client or anybody that goes through my materials that there's a bullet, a silver bullet. There's no such thing. Um, you may experiment 50 times before you get a success where someone else might just do it eight times, right? Yeah. I failed 139 times with my prototype before my product that NASA ever certified, but right? you know, that was 139 failures. So if someone had given me a number in my mind, say, oh, you can't go past 20 or you're no more than 50, yeah. then what would happen psychologically by the time I reached the 19th, and I say one more experiment and I'm done. That's the wrong way to go about it. Uh, you, you just have to keep going. It could be 139. I could have stopped at 138. This never, have, the, the, that, yeah. that would be the disastrous thing to have. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. Why, that's why I avoid like, just putting a number around it. There is a number, <laughs> but it doesn't apply to everybody in every case and just how it is. But you, you need to figure what that means, what that means for you. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. so, so basically, uh, uh, your help, uh, your your second book. Yes. Uh, 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 growth thinking. Yeah, growth thinking. Yeah. Uh, is basically a notebook. Yeah. With a lot of uh, white paper. There. There's a, yeah, it's a design book. So it's a design methodology. So yeah. if you're familiar with uh, design thinking or mm -hmm. the business canvas model, um, it's a it's a methodology for growth hacking. So it's designed to be extremely agile, very flexible, but with the structures that don't allow the creativity of growth, ha growth, growth hacking to supersede the structure or the structure to supersede the creativity. So I call it kind of like, like peanut butter and jelly or chocolate and chili. Yeah. So if I told you about chocolate and chili, you'd be like, oh dude, that sounds disgusting. It doesn't sound yeah, right. Yeah. But you put them together, they taste amazing, like, like peanut butter and jelly. Yeah. So that's like creativity and structure, right? So in the growth hacking world, if the structure is too strong, the creativity doesn't take place. If the creativity is too strong, the structure doesn't work. So I solve exactly that problem. So I've got thousands of growth hackers around the world who use it. I, I work with a lot of non-growth hackers. So it's mostly designed actually for non-growth hackers rather than to people become. in the space. Yeah, exactly, to become. Because, because once they see how easy it is and there's a process to actually work with, because there isn't a process out there. If you take a very close look, where's there a methodology I can work with from A to Z to take, I call it idea, from idea to action in a snap, right? There's nothing out there. So yeah. the, the objective behind the book is take an idea to action in a snap and be able to growth hack what you wanted to growth hack. Rapid, yeah. rapid prototyping. Rap, rapid, yep, <laughs> rapid very prototyping. fast. Unfortunately, listeners cannot see now. Yeah, but, we'll put it but, on the screen. Uh, but yeah, 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 yeah. This is, this is uh, what's that? So this is um, a tool that I use for change, right? Which is our topic here today. Yes. Uh, so, so I look at change in a very interesting way. Um, I look at it and we'll get it on the screen, but it's uh, four quadrants. So we look at relevance versus context. And uh, the more relevant you are and the, the better the context, then the more ready you are for change versus where you're not. And what that means is relevance is about asking the right questions and context is about getting the right answers to those questions. And I have a cheat sheet that we will put up, I think somehow, yeah. right? Where people can take a look at it and we explain what is relevance versus context. And then I give you a, a, a cheat sheet where there are a set of questions that allow you to ask the this right one? type of question. Exactly, that's the one you can ask. These are the questions you ask yourself um, to, to determine if it's relevant or in context. And the reason I, I okay, so why, why did I come up with this tool was I'd have all these conversations with clients and I would ask them like, is, is this relevant? And is it in context? And, and people would be stunned. Like, what do you mean, is it relevant? Like, yeah. you know, like I'm stunned. Yeah. What, what, what do you mean? Well, what what I mean is like, okay, video, like, what we are like, okay, is video relevant today? Yeah, I mean, video is, is thanks to YouTube and the YouTubes of this world, it's become a, a medium that is very rich to use. Uh, it was difficult because the files were really big. It was very expensive to produce. Um, the level of capabilities to access were difficult. That's not today's world. Today's world, everyone can access video. Anyone can create a video. Yeah. A video can be easily hosted and distributed to almost anybody on the planet at the moment. So it's very relevant to be in video. And the context is, okay, well, what's changing in video? I mean, where is the demand in video? And uh, I think you guys have a solution for that. It's I think the cast view. Cast view, I think. Cast view, which is, uh, maybe you can explain it and then I can probably we put a bit of context to it. Castro yeah. is the most efficient uh, way to do film videos. Okay. Like we bring the equipment in the office, we leave it there, you can record anytime and we do all the pre-production, post-production support to it. 
Yeah. So and 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 what is what is important? Uh, the prices come down three to five times less okay. than business as usual. That's the that's the what the cost would normally be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Three three to five times less cost. Up to ten. Up to I, but 10, I, I don't want to say ten because it sounds uh, yeah. shady. You know, like okay, it sounds okay. like uh, yeah, too good could, to be true. But if you can but achieve sometimes, it, so, no, 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 no. I have examples where we achieve ten times. Uh, then then less, there you go. Yeah, less cost. Yeah, I mean, if you can achieve it and you can prove it, then you have. There should be no problem claiming it. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, I think three times cost savings is, is pretty good. Five is excellent. Ten is phenomenal. Yeah. You know, cutting it to a tenth of what would normally. I mean, so that's the thing. I mean, when I was talking about video and relevance, I mean, it's become so cost effective to to develop video today. Uh, and and I, I, when I say cost effective, I'm talking like, okay, I can get on my webcam and I can just produce a video. Of course, right? That's it's that simple. But what happens is, if you want to produce like a really good video, that's a different story, right? There's there's difference in in, in variety. Um, I think what you've done really well is you've identified in, in the sense of relevance that the demand for content development is going to do nothing but increase at yes. exponential rates. Exponential. And we see the data all around us. And, and video is the leader in that co uh, co content demand. So, of course, we've got images and text and voice, but video, because it brings all of it into one single rich medium, uh, supersedes all of them, right? And, and people love video, especially micro content, which we've been talking about, yes. where people get these, you know, uh, 30 second to 60 second, right? That's the definition. 10, 15, 30, no, doesn't matter. Sound bites, you know, like small only things. Up to small. 60 seconds maximum, yeah, yeah, though, yeah. right? Yeah. I would say. So, no, they can be over three, three to four minutes, but as long as you have a straight to the point content and, and amazing value to the listener, you know, yeah. you will keep them. You know? Yeah, and I think one of the things, I mean, bringing that into context, just the same conversation yeah. we're talking about is the, so the fire hose, uh, we've talked about this as well. So the fire hose is the algorithm used in a lot of the popular social media platforms like yeah. Instagram and yes. Twitter, and it just keeps you going. And so they have a limit on it. It's 60 seconds, uh, right? So yes. Instagram is 60 seconds. I think Twitter's the same. Yeah. Uh, I think Facebook Live may be the same as well, 60 seconds. Because the new YouTube Shorts is 60 seconds as well. They yeah. follow yeah. the same standard. Yes, yes, yes. So I think like bringing that into context is like these micro, micro content, uh, content should never exceed 60 seconds now yeah uh, because the platforms have made it like that I mean, yeah. they, they uh, forced uh, us to uh, do it when you said uh, time constraints <laughs> I, I remember uh wine you remember wine the platform yeah by twitter and it was six second videos six seconds wow I six second videos and it was amazing platform a lot of influencers a lot of things but twitter never came to live uh, bring it to life because they, they couldn't monetize it Wow. Like they cannot monetize Twitter, but that's the different story. Yeah. But the point is, uh, the, the this platform was ahead of its time because it was basically too short. You know, like too six short. second yeah. videos. Maybe, yeah. maybe now it it could work better or whatnot. Well, because of TikTok, so I think TikTok is thirty seconds. Is that correct? No, it's, uh, it's it, there are very variety. Fifteen seconds and sixty seconds. You know? Oh, it's either fifteen or or sixty. Either, either Something like, yeah, Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the fifteen second one, I mean, the really short ones with the the music and the dancing, which is obviously yeah, the most yeah, popular yeah. of these kinds of videos shows how much more micro micro content is becoming right yes and so how do you become relevant in a world where 15 seconds is the norm you, you get what i mean yeah uh, so these are the kinds of things like uh, you've, you've developed casvio um okay so let's go a few steps back yeah. what, what what's interesting here is that i can develop video on demand right i don't need to call you up and yeah. you come in yeah. i can just start producing videos now and i don't have to worry about how they come out on the other end because yeah. they'll come up professional and well yeah first solution Excellent for growth. The next part is educating clients on how to tap into that 15 second, microsecond ideas. And I think educating clients how to do that and why it's important will be really important in the sense of, of the future of how they'll develop video and bring their messages out to the world. Because that's how people are consuming today. Yeah, uh, for sure. That, that, that's something that uh, we have to uh, uh, communicate uh, yep. more even what we do is uh, communicating, but uh, we, yeah. we need to commu uh, co communicate more. Uh, but uh, let's stick to the media a little bit more. Sure. Uh, uh, the idea you have about the show that's not on TV, that's not on OTT platforms, uh, Netflix or Stars Play or whatever, it's on uh, YouTube. Yep. And uh, y you realize the power of video, of course, but, but tell me about the show that you are creating right now. So I've, I've created a show called the um, 10, 10 Day Growth Hacking Challenge. Okay, so we 10 Day Growth Hacking Challenge. 10 Day Growth Hacking and, Challenge. And, and, and the uh, uh, subtitle is uh, 10x in 10 days. Yeah, so it's um, 10 days, three growth hacks, 10x growth. 
Yeah, so the objective is to try to get you to 10x the, your growth in 10 days with three growth hacks. So every three days, a growth hack. On the final day, we do a review. So, um, so basically, we've started with the first a few episodes that yeah, you've like seen. Pilot, yeah. yeah, so we, we're, our first guy has 10x in 10 days, which is awesome, right? So this he really had yeah. 10x? Yes. Like, yeah. on his bank account, everything, like, like is it or? Like yeah, no, no, no. Like, number on number, he literally grew 10 times. Now, I'm, no, it is amazing, but what I'm going to say, that's not going to happen every time. So, so yeah, we're yeah, lucky yeah. that's our first guy. Yeah. Um, that may not happen with second, third, but the objective is we get you on track to 10x, right? So if in those 10 days you learn with those three growth hacks and then you move on. So I run something that will be coming after, which is called the All-Star Program. And the All-Star Program is, the, the book has 20 growth hacks in it. So I'll challenge you on the first three and 10 days to 10x. On the remaining 17, if you finish them in 60 days, I'll put you in my All-Star Program. Yet to be defined. How okay. that's going to work. Okay. Yeah. okay. So, so, so uh, the, the, the show is around the book? Yep. So Using the methodology. The, 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 the users are yep. uh, following the book, the methodologies. Yep. Not yep. all of them, but some yep. of them that you yep. uh, will be uh, able to implement yep. on, their, on their growth. And they have a... Uh, some coaching sessions with you also yeah so I, three, I work with them in the days. back room yeah so yeah. they're not left out in the dark i mean we we initially sit down we look at what their business looks like uh we discuss what are some of their growth plans we identify some of the growth problems on a very high level uh we decide where to focus or so part of the decision that we make in the very beginning uh is it one growth hack three times that you're going to improve or is it three different things that you're going to try it's it sounds very simple but can become very trivial in uh -huh. the process yeah. very s simple straightforward decision needs to be done very in the beginning so we decide um and then we we go from there and then we t talk about what is growth hacking i provide the materials and then they start and the objective is you know i'm, I'm working with a team right now and they keep putting in a hashtag in our in our chat pressure pressure and i said <laughs> it's a challenge but it's okay i mean i mean it's a constructive pressure, not a deconstructive pressure, of course, where we want to, in that short period of time, we want to use the energy and the lust of wanting to grow in an effective way and in a structured way that they could learn a process and then they're able to take that and then replicate it over and over again so they can 10x their business. Okay, so, so can people apply uh, now for that show or how... Well, or, or for now, just to buy a book? Well, the way it works is now it's by nomination. So you can get okay. nominated by me. You can get nominated by any of the contenders. Okay. And uh, the contenders get a lot of people contact them and say, hey, I want to get nominated. So yeah. they would uh, talk to them about it and then kind of introduce them to uh, me. Invitation only, basically. It's an invitation only for yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, like a clubhouse. Yeah. Like a clubhouse, yeah. yeah. Until, until it grows to a point that we can scale, of course, where we can yeah. work with more people. Um, and that's why we use video. We use video because video allows anybody to learn very quickly. I mean, watch these things, get inspired. You can see how just a normal everyday person like you can 10 access business. Anyone can do it. it. It's not restricted to unicorns. It's not restricted to startup companies. It's not restricted to tech companies. It's not restricted to a Harvard MBA. It's not restricted to a McKinsey consultant. It's okay, yeah. anybody can do it, literally. And that, that's the whole idea behind video, to yeah, show yeah. people that anyone can do it. Yeah. Yeah. The, the variety of uh, stories, the, the variety of uh, solutions, and the variety yep. of uh, success. That's Abs the, absolutely. That's the thing. Absolutely, uh, yeah. Nader, I think I can talk with you for another hour or two. <laughs> but I think for the first episode uh, uh, of you in uh, the Change Officer, thank you. We covered uh, quite a few topics. Is there, is there anything that we didn't cover? I have no, no idea. That's probably quite well, a bit. We started I think, so long, long time ago. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, as long as we get, the, I think, the cheat sheet to the audience to help them out with change, right? Yeah. I think that can be very relevant. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very, very Thank much you. for, for uh, being with us and uh, we'll definitely follow the episodes and, and show that you are creating, Thank uh, you. even maybe uh, uh, you know, collaborate on that, Yes, absolutely. but, uh, but absolutely. definitely something uh, tangible that uh, will uh, come out of uh, reading your book, we will implement in our work. You know. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Nadia. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for listening and watching this episode and of course make sure to like and subscribe or uh, comment and uh, suggest uh, what guests would you like to have in the Change Officer uh, podcast.